Welcome to Crontendo episode 39. The holiday season of 1988 continues. In fact, this episode covers a mere 11 days, from December 10th through December 20th. And while nowadays we've always complained about too many video game sequels, the same is true here. Five games are sequels to earlier Famicom releases. We also take a look at a few US releases from Data East, Mindscape, and Tengen. Which brings up an interesting point. Out of the 12 Japanese games this episode, none were released in the US. I believe this is actually the first episode where this happens. We've also seen fewer and fewer Famicom Disk System games lately, but a page is turned this episode as it actually features no FDS games. The system is not quite dead yet, but the trickle of releases will slow even further in 1989. We'll get the weirdest one out of the way first this time. 89 Deno Kyusei Uranai. Apparently published by someone called Induction Produce. Who are they? No idea. But it was developed by none other than the notorious Micronics. I'm glad they found work after being dumped by Capcom and SNK. 89 Deno is a hopelessly obscure release, but it actually has one really awesome thing about it. The cat driving the UFO. Look at that guy. He looks completely insane. What does he have anything at all to do with this game? This is like the greatest random thing ever found in any video game. If Micronics created this character, then I take back everything I've ever said about them. They're geniuses. What we're actually doing on this screen is entering in our birth date and gender. Because this is yet another electronic horoscope cartridge, and it tells your fortune for the year 1989. Now what the hell you say, we just had one of these last episode. Remember this one? It came out like 10 days before 89 Dino. What the hell? Well, 89 Dino bears the name of Jingukan, a publishing company that produced a very popular series of fortune-telling almanacs. So the card is just a video game companion to the almanac. I think it actually came with a printed version of the almanac in the package. Because of this, 89 Dino was pretty expensive, 9800 yen, about twice as much as most video games. So anyway, you can get your fortune as it pertains to various topic, and you can select a particular month, week, or even day. It looks boring, but there is one funny part, the love test. You put in someone's birth date, and then it analyzes your compatibility with them. However, you can select the same gender on this screen as yourself. So if I enter in the gender as male, the game does this instead. I'm even a little surprised the game gives you this option. At this point, the game pretends to lock up. The robot is saying that there has been a serious malfunction of some sort. I think the text below is telling you there's been some kind of incorrect input. Hmm? What's that you say? Oh, yeah, right, of course. Naturally you want to see that. Okay, here you go. Nice eyeshadow. So basically, this is just another stupid shovelware release, but man, is that cat flying the UFO cool. Another thrilling intro here. It's the classic slow-moving text scroll. At least this time it's livened up a bit with a bit of footage of some fighting. This, you see, is Fighting Road from Toei, the animation company. Most of Toei's games so far have been tie-ins to existing properties, but as far as I know, Fighting Road is an original concept. Well, not original original, but you know. Here's the road itself, I assume. Each stop along the road represents an opponent, and as you will undoubtedly have gathered by this point, Fighting Road is a one-on-one -on -one fighting game, though it is single-player only. There's no versus mode, and no choosable selection of characters, or anything interesting really. It's just about the most generic fighting game ever created. The characters are just faceless ciphers wearing mostly vaguely Eastern martial arts outfits. Still, it's not bad. Most fighting games this era are sort of terrible. But Fighting Road could be much worse. There are your standard punches and kicks. 
combinations of using the D-pad and buttons will perform more advanced moves, like the jumping kick that often doesn't connect, or a leg sweep, which usually does. There was supposed to be some sort of spinning kick, but I couldn't pull it off. Also, when you take damage, the blue bar starts filling up. When it starts flashing, you can, in theory, fire off a reportedly devastating fireball attack. However, I just couldn't seem to figure out how to perform it. It involves doing a high backflip, then hitting the B button, but I guess I never got the timing right. You need to beat up each opponent twice. This isn't a matter of winning 2 out of 3, you need to win 2 out of 2. And your health meter doesn't refill after the first fight, but your opponent does. Oh yeah, and the grab and throw move is actually pretty cool. I think the main issue with Fighting Road is just how boring it is on an aesthetic level. Besides that, it can be a bit frustrating the way certain special moves are so hard to pull off. Hardcore Gaming 101 did a big article on pre-Street Fighter 2 fighting games, and also noted the difficulty in consistently performing the special moves, so I'm not the only one who feels this way. The blue meter is sort of like an early version of super moves found in later fighting games. It's a very cool idea, and if I could figure out how to use it, I might like the game a bit better. For those of you who just watched Cron Turbo Episode 2, you'll remember a fantastic game from Victor Musical Enterprises called The Legendary Axe. Well, here's another one from Victor, but this one is not so great. Kaguya Hime Densetsu, or Legend of the Moon Princess, developed by Micronix, it seems. But wait a sec, calm down, it does have some redeeming qualities. Thankfully, we have an English translation from Snark under the name Moon Princess. This angel is talking to you when suddenly she gives you a whip and a candle. Whoa, that's pretty kinky for an angel. And I love the Castlevania-esque musical theme that appears here. Kaguya Hime is an old Japanese folktale, also known as Takatori Monogatari, Tale of the Woodcutter. It's about an old woodcutter who finds a glowing bamboo stalk. So he cuts it open and finds a baby girl inside who grows up to be an unnaturally beautiful but sort of mysterious lady. It eventually turns out that she's from the moon and has to return. Which makes me wonder, doesn't calling the story Kaguya Hime Moon Princess sort of spoil the ending? Why would you want to give away the surprise at the end like that? Imagine if we did that nowadays. It would make the whole deal of having some kind of plot twist at the end completely pointless. So anyway, certain elements of this story and other Japanese folktales were used in Nintendo's adventure game for the FDS, Nushin Onigashima. This is a very basic adventure game which mixes in bits of other games. You start by wandering around, you find an old man who wants matches, and a cabin guarded by some terrifying beast you can't get past. And in the beginning, that's pretty much all there is. It seems pretty clear you're going to have to end up going to that cave at the beginning. The game does give you like these weird sections where you need to control your movements using the D-pad, such as here. You sort of move around randomly until you happen to find the girl who's lying in the cave for some reason. You're always finding unconscious people in these Japanese adventure games. You have a few unusual menu options under the exclamation point, including kiss. If you kiss the girl, it'll wake her up and she gives you the matches out of gratitude, I guess. You can now talk to the old guy and explore the dark cabin. Once you get there, you can light a match, and it turns out the creature in the cabin is really not that frightening. It should be clear by this point that Kaguya Princess is one of those wacky Japanese games that's chock full of anachronisms. For example, you'll find a teddy bear and a pair of sunglasses inside the cabin. For the most part, the game seems pretty simple, though it does have a habit of hiding important objects in completely unremarkable places. Once you find the axe, you can chop your way through the bamboo forest, but the axe is hidden in just some random tree. Okay, here we go, and geez, this is really starting to look like a Micronix game, huh? Weird little action sequences pop up from time to time. You can die in this game, and unlike some of these games, you can screw up if you don't find all the important items. I encountered a snake, and so I tried kissing it, and I get killed, or rather, taken to a weird place. 
which turns out to be a seedy afterlife bar called the Back Alley. Hmm. What you were supposed to do is use the knife to attack the snake. The whole sequence is quite silly. You just wait till the snake is in your line of sight and then throw the knife. Anyway, I ended up with a premature ending to the game a moment later. It turns out I didn't find the apple at the very beginning of the, of the very first screen, and I was supposed to give the apple to revive the girl. Kissing her instead caused me to get a game over at this point. The angel gives me an ugly princess because of my misdeeds by kissing a girl, or groping a girl as his translation says. Kaguya Princess is kind of a mixed bag. It's funny and entertaining in spots, but it's also sort of terrible at the same time. Maybe the secret is making sure that my chronic sticks to text and static graphic images in its games. Hey, it's Captain Silver! We saw this not too long ago in Cron Sega 6. I thought the Master System version was not too bad, but this Famicom version, released by Tokuma Shoten, is a whole nother ball of wax. As you may recall, Captain Silver is a rollicking little pirate-themed adventure where you... Holy cow, what happened to those werewolves? They're emaciated. Has there some, been some sort of famine in Captain Silverland? Remember how they looked in the Master System game? Nice, healthy, well-dressed werewolves. They look like they walked right out of Jean Cocteau's Beauty and the Beast. But the changes go far beyond graphics. The game's handling was also seriously downgraded. Your weapon no longer swings in a deadly arc, but instead you stick it straight out in front of you in a thrusting motion. Also, your character moves even more stiffly than he did in the Master System game. As a result, in moments like this, where the apples or pumpkins fall from the trees, you are almost guaranteed to take a hit or two. In Sega's version, you could be quick and graceful enough to take out any falling apples and dispatch the werewolves that converge on you. Collecting letters to form the word Captain Silver has also been dropped, but the shops are still here, though the shopkeepers all have new graphics, one of the very few things that could be considered an upgrade of sorts. As mentioned, it is now much harder to avoid enemy attacks, and enemies also take multiple hits, so you now have a life bar instead of one-hit deaths. While the Master System version can be very difficult at times, I think this one is actually even more frustrating. I have no idea who was responsible for this port, presumably not Data East themselves. Some odd changes have been made, such as the bosses. At the end of the first level, instead of fighting the witch, you encounter Frankenstein. Really? Though I confess I find his rubber-legged walking animation pretty amusing. Looks like he's doing some kind of crazy dance. Though I do wonder, what is the story with Tokuma Shoten? They were a media company, they published magazines and things, but almost every single Famicom game they've published has been a port of a game by some other company. They've released Capcom titles, a Ballast game, and now a Data East game. It's odd. Anyway, out of the three Captain Silvers, the Arcade, the Master System, and the Famicom, this one is definitely the worst. Uh-oh, Dr. Sparkle's getting a little pissed at Taito. Why? Because of this game. Kyo Kyoku, Harikiri Stadium, 88. Subtitled, Senshu Shin Data. The Shin Data should be a tip-off. The game presents a new variation on the intro of the first game. In fact, the intro, where the guy gets crushed by a giant baseball, was the most memorable thing about that game. So we have the same options as the first game. Once again, you start by picking out your team and then your starting lineup. You then get the same two sports announcers. The game looks just like the first one. It feels like the same game. That's because it is the first one. As the subtitle says, this is new data. They must have updated the roster or stats or something. But check it out, here's the first game. Same guys. This looks the same. Oh, I see, the infield's a different color. Okay. Nowadays, we complain about uh, EA releasing the same sports games each year with minimal differences, but they didn't actually start this. 
Hell, they waited a few years between uh, sports games back then. Look at one-on-one -on -one basketball games. Nope, it was Japanese publishers like Taito. They were the guys doing this back in the 1980s. So since Taito is basically wasting our time here, we'll move on. Let's switch it up a bit with an actual good game from Konami. It's been a while since we've seen a really cool Konami game that we can sort of sink our teeth into. And now here's Gradius 2, a cart which was, for some reason, never released in the US. Now things have changed quite a bit since the original came out in 1985. First thing we notice is you can choose from several different configurations for your bomb, gun, and laser. I'm gonna go with the Ripple laser. Both the Ripple and the regular laser have their own advantages. The game begins much like the original Gradius. Shoot up some waves of basic enemies, pick up a few power-ups, maybe a speed-up, missiles, or a, maybe a better weapon. And then a moment later, things start getting really crazy. You pass through a gauntlet of huge red fireballs, or maybe really small stars, and out come these giant flaming dragon snake things. The original game, which was still pretty new, having been released in 1988, featured mind-blowing graphics for the time. Though again, for reasons unknown, it was only released in Japan and in Europe under the rather stupid name of Vulcan Venture. It was one of the hardest arcade shoot-em-ups ever. The difficulty was actually sort of detrimental to your enjoyment of the game. The Famicom version can't produce those huge impressive sprites, but still, it looks really good. Maybe the Famicom's lack of processing power improved the game, since the home version is a bit more playable than the arcade game, which just floods the screens with enemies. And some slowdown does occur when too many sprites are on the screen at once, which actually helps in spots. Still, the Famicom Gradius 2 is brutally hard in places, and like the first game, getting killed in certain spots is virtually a game over, since it strips you of all your power-ups, and sends you back to the last checkpoint. So when playing Gradius 2, just don't make too many mistakes. Thankfully, the shield will give you a bit of protection. One major improvement over the first game is the bosses. Gradius 2 has lots of them, and they're all different. The level 1 boss is a giant phoenix. Level 2 starts with this crazy eyeball and tentacle guy. And then you immediately go on to the next boss, a robot skull which made an appearance in Salamander. He doesn't seem that aggressive, but you'll probably be surprised when he opens up his mouth and fires a giant laser at you for the first time. Level 3 is one of a couple references to the earlier game, and is sort of a super amped up version of the first level of Gradius, with more enemies and more volcanoes. Then you get the typical shoot your way out of an asteroid build level, except with purple crystals. These levels are not too terrible if you're well powered up and have the shield, otherwise you're probably going to get overwhelmed. Level 4 marks the return of the classic Moai heads. And then the boss is three giant Moai heads. If you have enough weaponry, this boss is actually sort of simple and boring. And then the next level pulls a classic move, the boss rush level, five in a row. You start with a classic shoot the core guy. He'll probably be a piece of cake. Then you get the brain with tentacles and eyeballs from Salamander, aka Life Force, the Gradius sequel that isn't actually called Gradius. I think he was harder in Salamander, his arms were longer or something. Then you have another core type boss, this time with these really irritating tentacle arms. He's sort of like a mutant love child of the last two bosses. Then we have this guy, who I believe is also taken directly out of Salamander and then the hardest boss in the game. It's another core type ship with revolving protective plates, who spits out indestructible missiles, so you pretty much have to spend the entire fight constantly weaving in and out between these things. Needless to say, if you die, you start the whole level over from the very beginning. And then, the fifth level continues to pummel the player in submission with these narrow claustrophobic corridors, and then you get some fast-moving levels. The game throws tons of enemies at you, and with little room to move around, it's really easy to get shot. All the guys on the ground make missiles a necessity. 
The first boss of this level actually sort of resembles the outside of the base from Contra. It has a few cannons you have to shoot out there. And the second one is a giant spider thing, where you have to make your way between the legs very carefully because it spans the entire screen vertically and sneaks up on you from behind, which makes me wonder, why can't the big viper just turn around? I mean, after blowing up the alien's base, he goes right back to Earth. It's not like he's just flying in one direction until he runs out of gas. For its final level, Radius 2 goes full salamander. Everything's made out of brain matter or something. The level tries to kill you by suddenly surprising you with changes in the landscape, including some that block the path completely if you're not quick enough. And then you get the last boss, a giant head missing his skin and his skull cap and he shoots bubbles at you. Definitely one of the creepiest looking video game bosses so far. So after all this, what can we say about Gradius 2? It's a fantastic game, it takes the core gameplay of the first, and adds more variety, surprises, and cool stuff. Of course, there's still the unforgiving difficulty, and the fact that getting killed once practically means game over, though you do have unlimited continues. Still, it is one of the better shoot 'em ups on the system, and it's a real shame that it never came out in the US. Maybe the game would have been impossible to reprogram without Konami's custom mapper chip. Remember, of course, that in Japan, manufacturers could actually produce their own chips and cartridges, whereas in the US, everything was manufactured by Nintendo. Oddly, there was another game called Gradius 2 released for the MSX, but it turned out to be a completely different game. So, all in all, it's a fine addition to the Konami 8-bit canon and worth checking out. And Konami will return in early 1989 with a sequel to one of their biggest hits in Japan. We've got a trio of racing-themed games coming up, starting with the Triathron. Oh my. And to top it off, the graphic in the title screen makes it look like the swimmer has boobs. Well, this is from K Amusements, or KAC as they are called, developed by who knows. And it's a game based on the Triathlon, a race that combines swimming, biking, and running. Here's your character options. Hmm, different head, same body. If you look carefully, you'll see one character is from Ostlaria. Each has their own stats, including Dush. The game begins with the swimming part. The first event takes place in Chicago, and the game is very much in the classic track and field button mashing mode. You hit the B button to swim and use the D-pad to move around. Swimming will drain your stamina if you constantly swim too fast. You have to watch out for hazards, other swimmers, the edge of the track, and of course, huge, deadly whirlpools because swimming competitions take place in extremely dangerous waters. These things will actually suck you in and you'll drown. And the steering controls are weird, they're based on the swimmer's perspective, so they'll be reversed if you're headed towards the bottom of the screen. Bicycling seems pretty harmless. Button mashing is not so much of a problem as steering your bike is. You can't turn smoothly, instead hitting left or right will cause you to suddenly point at a 45 degree angle. So hitting the side of the road while going around curves is pretty common. Running is just button mashing and jumping. This street is filled with bushes and potholes for some reason. And I don't even know how you actually win a race. There's no timer displayed while you're racing, so you really have no idea how you're doing until the race is over. Oh, I came in first? That's a surprise. You didn't get a few points to spend on your stats. The next round takes place in Japan, which looks just like Chicago. So I'd say Triathlon is a completely non-distinguished sports game, and it seems highly unlikely that you're going to want to play it for more than a few minutes. Hopefully you weren't expecting much. Let's pause for just a second, take a look at what was going on in the US at the end of 1988. The Nintendo Entertainment System was enormously successful throughout 88 and continued to be the hot item for kids that Christmas. Nintendo of America solidified their hold on the minds of young Americans 
with the creation of the Nintendo Power magazine earlier in the year. Now, Around this time, the American and Japanese markets were becoming increasingly independent, and a number of games came out developed exclusively for the US market, such as Rare's game show titles for Game Tech, as well as a few games from Nintendo, Sunsoft, and others. Still, the floodgates of Western releases had not quite opened, so a motley collection of Japanese games were hitting the shelves in late 1988. For example, uh, Super Mario Bros. 2 in October. November and December saw such major releases as Castlevania 2 Simon's Quest, and another enormous hit sequel, Zelda 2 The Adventures of Link. Other Japanese games to come out in November or December 88 were Blaster Master, Rebel Warrior, Kimco Superman, and even older games like Dr. Chaos and Othello. I'd say December 1988 is when things started to change. From here on out, we're going to deal with US-only games in just about every single episode of Crontendo. Okay folks, we're now going to look at a few US releases that came out in December 1988, though the exact dates don't seem to have been preserved. Interestingly, all three are ports of arcade games that have already been around the block a few times. Data East has already released a handful of US-only games so far, and here's another one, Rampage. Which was, in 1988, cutting edge in its use of destructible environments. The Bally Midway arcade game original, which came out in 1986, gave the option of up to three players at once. The objective was simply rack up points, causing death and destruction. You're supposed to smash every building on the screen. Each level supposedly took place in another American city, though every city looked exactly alike. Rampage was reasonably charming and was just sort of good old fashioned mindless fun. Now the NES version is for one or two players only, thus removing the giant wolfman Ralph. Other than that, the home version is more or less accurate to the original in the way that it plays. The screen layouts are very similar, but man, has Rampage really suffered from the drop in the hardware's graphical powers? I mean, this is really ugly looking, with the bright blue and forest green buildings. And the monsters have lost a lot of their character. They all had a bit of personality in the arcade games. Here you mostly have the same blank facial expression. And you can't really see what the various items are inside the building when you're smashing open windows. Here are the tiny graphics used for people and objects that you find when smashing walls make them really hard to distinguish. Some of the objects will make you lose health when you eat them, others will make you gain health, but it's kind of hard to tell what you're actually grabbing sometimes. Getting hit by the army's weapons or falling off a building will also cause you to lose health. If your life bar drops down to zero, you revert back to human form and it's game over. Naturally, you find yourself completely nude once you return to normal size, and you slink off the screen with your hands over your private parts. Amazingly, the belated sequel, Rampage World Tour from 1997, basically depicted full frontal nudity when you turned back into a human, though in tiny little sprite form. The thing about Rampage is it was very much an arcade game. It's fun to drop a few quarters in it, but the repetitive nature doesn't really make it very fun for home play. It's hard to imagine anyone spending hours upon hours playing it, since not much changes as you progress through the game. Really, it's not the best choice for an NES release. Oh man, good lord. Seriously, someone go get Paperboy a trophy, because it's just one ugliest video game title screen ever. Paperboy is one of two games this episode that are ports of arcade titles from Atari Games, published for the NES by Mindscape. Mindscape being the Northern California computer company that also published the computer versions of the Mac Venture games, such as Deja Vu and Shadowgate. They also published some of the computer versions of Paperboy, so I assume they held the rights for the US console releases as well. They got sucked up into the learning company and were involved in such games as Mario is Missing. Somehow, they're still around today. In Paperboy, you control a newspaper delivery boy, which is not a very exciting idea for a video game, except that you live in this crazy neighborhood full of angry dogs, breakdancers, swarms of bees, the Grim Reaper. Considering that newspapers usually have to be delivered at the crack of dawn, the neighborhood is awfully lively for this early in the morning. 
Paperboy began life as a 1984 arcade game from Atari Games. Wow, doesn't the title screen look nice here? As I recall, it had a controller shaped like the bicycle handlebars. The object is to deliver a newspaper to all the subscribers' houses while avoiding obstacles. And for extra points, you can vandalize the houses of non-subscribers by throwing newspapers at their windows, and so on. Now, while Mindscape did the US version, eventually, a few years later, this was released in Japan by Ultron, who seems to specialize in Western-developed titles. They release stuff like Disney games and Bratz games nowadays. It's kind of a shame that guys like Ultron and Mindscape are still around, yet Atari Games has folded. At the end of each level, you get a bonus section, which allows you to pick up some extra points by throwing newspapers at targets and whatnot. Now, it's really not fair to criticize an arcade conversion for not looking as good as the original, but damn, it doesn't really feel like Tengen put that much effort into this. You can barely even recognize some of the obstacles. The breakdancer is just a guy standing on his head, for example. Compare Paperboy to something like Gradius 2 to see just exactly how cheap this looks. Also, the obstacles can be a bit trickier to avoid than in the arcade game. While playing this, there were a number of times when I thought I was going to slip by a fence or a kid on a skateboard or something, and I ended up colliding with it. I guess the hit detection seems just a bit off. Like Rampage, Paperboy is not a bad game, it's just one that pales in comparison to some of the other stuff coming out at this time. Oh no. This horribly ugly title screen belongs to the last US release this episode. It's another Tengen game published by Mindscape. Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, once again based on an arcade game. Orange and purple, the best color scheme, huh? So what is this screen? Touch prize to collect, touch kid to see prize? Whoa, that's kinda weird. So how do you start the game? Pressing buttons doesn't do anything. I'll try pressing start. No? Well then... Well, actually you press select to start each level, or wave, as the game calls them. So, what's going on? Ah, what happened? Whoa, I see. Unlike every NES game in existence, the B button is used for jumping and A is for attacking. And when you jump, you jump by default in the down direction. So, what in God's name is going on here? Well, believe it or not, this is based on a semi-decent arcade game from 1985, which was based on the 1984 movie. Now, I will confess I liked this game back in the day, and was never bothered by the impossible MC Escher-like geometry imposed on the systems of catwalks and lava pits. It had some on-foot levels where you rescued kids, some minecart levels. You'd drive around real fast on a minecart. Later, there's a showdown on a bridge. You got to swing across fiery lava pits using your whip. It was simple, but full of fun and atmosphere. By contrast, the home version is just baffling. Why does Indy huff and puff like he's out of breath when he stops moving? Oh, and the arrow indicates there's a hidden door here. But we need a bomb to blow open the wall. And since the game just started, we have no bombs yet. Here's Tengen's version of the minecart level. You can jump out of the minecart onto the hot pink conveyor belts, but you're still on foot rescuing children most of the time. It's completely different than the arcade minecart level. Now when you rescue kids, they'll drop items, usually swords, guns, or keys. Which raises the obvious question, how do these kids end up being so well armed if they're being held captive, and why can't they use their weapons to escape themselves? Normally guns are pretty useful in a jailbreak. Anyway, I call this mystery of well-armed prisoners the Metal Slug Enigma. It's not that uncommon in video games. Anyway, once you have knives, you know what they're used for? Opening doors. Yes, really. Also, you find keys, which are also used to open doors, but different kinds of doors. Guns can be used for shooting enemies, but also for hitting small skulls that reveal hidden grappling points. And you know how you change weapons from like the whip to the knife or the gun? Well, not by using the inventory screen that shows all your weapons, that's for sure. No, you press select and then press a button on the D-pad. You see, unlike the arcade game, the controls and rules of Temple of Doom are needlessly complicated and arbitrary. And for the most part, they just make no sense, like using swords to open doors. 
Or take the secret doors, for example, used to skip to the next level, or wave. Sounds useful, but according to the manual, quote, if you use a secret door to skip ahead and have not freed any slave children on that wave, you will be awarded all the map pieces for that wave. If you have freed only some of the map pieces, you will not get any of the map pieces for that wave. End quote. And you need all the map pieces to use in the map room, which is a special wave after wave 9. You need the map pieces to figure out how to get to wave 10. So if you already found all the map pieces on a wave, and then use a secret door, do you get all the map pieces or none of the map pieces? And the whole game is like this. The manual is 14 pages long and is full of rules about how you're supposed to use a particular item in a particular spot or something, and none of this stuff you could naturally figure out through the game's internal logic. It's like Tengen tried to make a game more console-like with lots of secrets and stuff, but failed miserably. The whole thing is like a huge mess. Something else that's sort of weird is that while this was released by Mindscape as an official licensed cart, Tengen also released it as an unlicensed cart with different box art. That is sort of weird in and of itself, but the real question is, why was Temple of Doom considered to be such a hot commodity that it actually warranted two separate NES releases? Well, anyway, in my opinion, this is far and away the worst of the three US releases this episode. And a mere one day later, we have Top Rider from Bari, and developed by Human. Human has produced some competent, if unexciting, stuff so far, and Top Rider will definitely not fall into the category of exciting. You have two modes, Touring and Grand Prix. Touring just consists of one-off races, and is pretty pointless. Grand Prix requires you to win a whole bunch of races, it's like a standard career mode. We'll try the seaside level. That sounds pleasant, and... Whoa, lord, why is the water so high? It's like the town is going to get engulfed in a massive wave of water. It's really kind of scary looking. So, Top Rider is a pretty kooky game. Here's just one minor irritation. On the Grand Prix mode, when entering your name, you can't move the cursor up or down, only left or right. Now come on, how hard would it have been to program in the ability to move your cursor from row to row? It would make typing in your name go much more quickly. So, Top Rider greatly resembles an uglier version of Sega's Hang On. In fact, the game is sort of like a poor man's arcade Hang On. You see, it came with, if you can believe this, an inflatable motorcycle that you sit on while playing the game. There is even a special handlebar controller that attaches to the inflatable motorcycle. It's an interesting idea to say the least, but playing the game is not too special. You have two gears, low and high, you zip around other opponents, race a couple laps. I like racing games, but Top Rider manages to be pretty boring. The backgrounds are decent, I suppose, but the stripes on the side of the road whiz by so fast they just turn into like a pink blur. Also, there's a fuel gauge, but you never seem to use up any fuel. So it gets pretty much a mediocre racer with a really unusual peripheral. Well, here we go. Final Fantasy II, the sequel to Square's company-saving game, released almost exactly a year after the first one. One thing Square had not yet learned to do was make a decent title screen. Unlike the first one, this was never released outside of Japan, so instead we're going to play the classic translation from Demiforce. Number two switches gears a bit and pulls out the old Star Wars type plot, Evil Empire vs. Brave Rebel Forces. Sort of like Fantasy Star, though there the Rebel Forces just comprise three people and a cat, and they mostly just performed an assassination on the head of state. You can choose your characters' names here, though all four have official names. Though when spelled out in Roman characters, the names are just a little bit too long to actually fit. This guy's official name is Freonel, or something like that. It varies from version to version. I'm going to call him Freon. Final Fantasy II skips the standard RPG opening and jumps right into the action, with your party being attacked by four powerful Dark Knights. It's one of those impossible-to-win battles. You will always lose. And then we learn through a cutscene that you were rescued by the deposed Princess of the Kingdom. 
unlike the first Final Fantasy, your characters are all distinct individuals with recognizable character portraits and a tiny hint of personality, I suppose. This approach would return in a much more developed form in Final Fantasy IV. One unique feature is the dialogue system. Certain words spoken by NPCs need to be remembered by the characters, and you can speak memorized words back to NPCs. This will generally trigger them to divulge some sort of information about your next goal, and often a new trigger word. And this is pretty much how the plot is advanced. Once you step out into the village, the game settles into the more typical RPG flow. You visit shops, fight random battles, try to talk to the annoying, fast-moving townspeople. You also meet important NPCs right at the beginning, such as Paul, the, the master thief who dresses like a ninja, and Gordon, the cowardly prince who eventually learns to embrace his destiny. While many of the game's graphics are borrowed from Final Fantasy 1, it does feature a large and almost completely new set of enemies. A few innovations have been introduced into battles, such as the back row. You can move any character from the front row to the back row, not in battle, but while you're on the main map, and the back row is safe from physical damage, but it can only use magic or ranged weapons. And more stats have been introduced, including magic points, and you now have individual skill stats for every single weapon in the game. You see, despite its surface similarity to the first game, pretty much everything has been changed. The mechanics behind your experience and levels are completely different than in any other Final Fantasy game. There are no experience points or levels. Instead, your stats slowly increase as you use them. Use a lot of physical attacks and your power will go up. If you use a lot of black or white magic, your intelligence or soul will go up. Magic spells have levels on them as well. To increase the level, you have to use that magic spell over and over again. However, this takes an incredibly long time, since you won't be normally using magic on every single battle. Now there is a rather tedious shortcut in which you can use a magic spell, cancel, and then use it again, and then repeat. If you do this oh, a good hundred times in one battle, the magic spell should easily gain a level. Likewise, your hit points and magic points will go up if you take a lot of damage or use a lot of MP. This means the best way to increase your health points is to have party members attack themselves and each other. If you win a battle with low health, your max health will increase, sometimes. If Final Fantasy II doesn't seem like any game in the series, that's because the main game designer was a very evil man called Akitoshi Kawazu. The crazy, illogical, and monotonous mechanics he introduced into the game have resulted in Final Fantasy II being the most hated 2D game in the series. It's the classic black sheep in the Final Fantasy family. Thus, Square wisely decided to take Kawazu off Final Fantasy and quarantine him in his own series, starting in the 1989 Final Fantasy Legend on the Game Boy, or Makai Toshi Saga, as it's called in Japan. Kawazu's Saga series became legendary for its obscure, illogical, and confusing mechanics. The thing about Final Fantasy II is, other than its nutty system for stats and leveling, it's actually an improvement over its predecessor in many ways. There are a lot of new and creative elements, like this town being held under Imperial control, and you will be discovered if you try to talk to any of the enemy soldiers milling around. You also get wiped out very quickly if this happens. And many, many recurring Final Fantasy elements make their first appearance here, such as the airship captain, Sid. And there's a pretty huge selection of weapons available, including ranged weapons, namely bows, and there are now no classes, so anyone can equip any weapon or armor and use any magic. Also, a rotating fourth party member is introduced. At various points, someone will temporarily join your party, starting with Min, or Ming Wu, however you want to transliterate the name, who has a rather huge selection of magic and is actually pretty useful early in the game. For methods of transportation, you'll have a boat and later an airship, but to get across the ice lake, you'll need to use a special sled. This is provided by Joseph, the second rotating character, who has powerful hand-to-hand -hand combat skills. As we see here, many of the typical elemental properties of the first game are still in place. For example, healing spells destroy the undead, and fire is pretty effective against them as well. As a rule, however, magic is somewhat underpowered when it comes to offense. 
Even the best magic spell, Ultima, and yes, Ultima is introduced in this game as well, is not very effective except for the last boss. Now, perhaps we need a spoiler alert at this point. The most surprising element in this Final Fantasy is the number of party member deaths. Most people think of Fantasy Star 2 or Final Fantasy 7 when it comes to characters getting killed, but Square was definitely at its most bloodthirsty here. Joseph sacrifices himself to save the rest of the party and gets crushed by a rock. To then even further bump up the pathos, you can return to his village, you can talk to his girlfriend and daughter and break the sad news. All told, three party members and one NPC get wiped out by the game's end. And while it's not strictly a character, you do come across a dying dragon, or Hiyu, that requests you place its egg into a magical spring so it can hatch. The Hiyu passes away once you accomplish this. Now aside from the weird leveling mechanics, Final Fantasy II has some other irritating factors, like the fact that the dungeons contain many, many doors, which sometimes contain valuable or important items, but more often than not the room is empty, which usually leads to a completely gratuitous fight. I mean, seriously, there are tons of doors which basically function as traps. Naturally, enemies can cast an ungodly number of status spells on you. Poison, blindness, confusion, stone, silence, sleep, instant death, and some new ones like curse and mini, which shrinks you down to little tiny helpless size. Furthermore, unlike the first game, each individual potion or item takes up one slot in your rather limited inventory, so you can't just stock up on eye drops and golden needles. Of course, you have magic spells for healing these things, but you don't have a whole lot of points at first, and the potions which replenish your magic are outrageously expensive, at least they are in the beginning of the game when you actually need them. Now, the second Final Fantasy game is much more linear and tightly plotted than the first one. It does resemble the later Final Fantasy IV in that sense. This does sort of make sense because instead of wandering around the world looking for the hideout of some archdemon, you're actually in the middle of a war between an invading empire and rebel forces. Much of the game's first half revolves around the threat of the Death Star-like warship. Eventually, the queen is kidnapped and taken aboard, and you'll need to infiltrate the warship to find the princess and then destroy the engines, which gives you a nifty cutscene. Sid comes along and helps you escape in his airship. From there, you'll meet a lady pirate, Layla, who joins the party and gives you access to her ship. Oh yeah, and these are one of the more annoying enemies. Each one casts fire on the entire party, and there is a separate fire animation for each party member, so one round of attacks takes forever, and they can actually kill weaker members in a couple rounds if they ambush you. The whole thing takes a very long time, so it's sort of like you get up and make a sandwich when you get ambushed by these things. The story takes kind of a weird turn here. After you return to check on the princess, you are told she's acting strangely and has gone mad. When you go to check on her in her room, she hops into bed and tells Freenail to come over and get busy. He reluctantly agrees, and just when you think you're going to see an 8-bit porn scene, the princess turns out to be an imposter and a boss battle ensues. It would have been interesting to see if this would have made it to the US release, which was translated but then actually cancelled by Square. From here you need to make your way to the Empire's arena to battle for the princess's life, and then you fight a boss, Behemoth. Yep, Behemoth makes his debut here. After that you help the rebel army take back the castle of Finn, and restore the princess and Gordon to their thrones. Then it's off to find the magical city of Mysidia, now you have to go to Mysidia to advance the plot, but while you're there you can purchase the Change Magic, which swaps your HP and MP for that of the enemy that you cast it on. This sounds only useful in some situations, but it does have a another use. Casting it on super weak enemies will instantly lower your HP and MP down to almost nothing. When you win the battle, your maximum health and magic should have increased. This is the fastest way to raise your health and magic. And of course it keeps with the Final Fantasy tradition, of breaking the game system. The only other option is just to cast tons and tons of magic spells for no reason and attack yourself a lot. While level design and enemies are similar to those in Final Fantasy 1, Square does add some new things to the mix. There are some unique ideas for dungeons, like this weird plant-filled dungeon. 
As mentioned earlier, a lot of standard Final Fantasy enemies appear for the first time, such as bombs, Marlboros, Corels, Puddings, which are annoying because they take almost no damage against physical attacks, so you have to spend lots of magic points fighting these guys. Speaking of odd dungeons, at one point you get sucked up by Leviathan and end up inside his stomach, kind of like in the movie Pinocchio. And there's all sorts of folks marooned inside, including Richard the Dragoon. He's heavily armored, though he can't jump or anything, so he's not very much like the Dragoons in later games. Still, Dragoons are another recurring theme that appears here for the first time. Longtime Final Fantasy fans may wonder, what exactly is a Dragoon anyway? Some sort of spear-wielding, heavily armored knight, right? Well, actually, in real life, no. This is what a Dragoon usually looked like. They were basically cavalry-infantry hybrids, and bear no resemblance to their video game counterparts. Sorry, I don't know why Square called their characters Dragoons. After escaping from Leviathan, things go from bad to worse, as the Emperor has sent some sort of magical tornado to destroy much of the planet. Thankfully, the Hiyu Egg has hatched and can now fly you into the Whirlwind, which is another huge dungeon. Eventually, you encounter the main bad guy, the Emperor himself. He's guarded by a few knights and a giant golem, but he ends up going down pretty easily. After killing the Emperor, everybody's happy and celebrates with a dance. Veteran RPG gamers will know something's not quite right, and it turns out that the Dark Knight is none other than your missing friend Lionheart, or Leonheart as some versions call him. He's become the new Emperor and now you've got to stop him. Naturally, more tragedy strikes. Sid dies, so I guess it's a total of five party members or NPCs that die in the game. But he does give you his airship. You're now free to fly around the world, and you'll see that quite a few cities were completely destroyed by the whirlwind, and tougher monsters are wandering around everywhere. The whole destroyed world bit is pretty similar to the second part of Final Fantasy VI. See what I mean? Everything in this game was reused in some later game in the series. A lot of other things appeared first here as well. Phoenix Downs, uh, the Genji Armor, Elixirs, Chocobos. Even more so than the first game, the sequel sort of sets the standard for the series in many ways. If you overlook the perverse system for leveling up and building your stats, it's actually quite innovative. It was remade a few times, just like every other 2D Final Fantasy game. For the PlayStation and Game Boy Advance versions, it was graphically reworked. Among the other things, the, uh, the overworld and the battle sprites now resembled the characters. The Famicom version just borrowed sprites from the first game, so Frien is the uh, red-haired fighter, though his character portrait looks completely different. The Game Boy Advance uh, version, Dawn of Souls, also adds a bunch of uh, additional content, and I believe they made the game quite a bit easier, just like they did with Final Fantasy 1. For example, if you target an enemy that gets killed that round, you will automatically retarget another enemy, not wasting your turn. So anyway, after tracking down Lionheart, it turns out the Emperor has returned from the dead, and Richard the Dragoon dies so that you can escape with Lionheart and bring him back to the Princess, where he decides to join you in your fight against the Emperor. The end game consists of getting the best weapons and armor, including the two best swords, Excalibur and Masamune, and then the final dungeon is naturally a huge, confusing mess full of tough enemies. One interesting thing about this game is the characters don't have any classes like in Final Fantasy 1 or 3, nor do they have predefined abilities like in Final Fantasy 4 or Fantasy Star or Dragon Quest 2. Nope, they're all pretty much blank slates, and any character can equip any armor or weapon and can learn any spell. It's really up to you how you want to use your characters. The game allows you to customize your stats. For example, if you want to have a strong physical strength, you just use the physical attacks a lot to build up your strength. And uh, for magic users, you can just cast a lot of magic spells. But even magic users can be pretty strong. Maria, who was in theory my weak magic using character, found a really good bow and for a while ended up being the most powerful physical attacker, putting the two supposed tanks to shame. Now there are some caveats, such as the way that the equipment affects your stats. Equipping a shield raises your defense, but decreases your attack. Equipping heavy weapons will decrease your magic, but overall you have an amazing amount of control and freedom over your character. Now there are a ton of magic spells in the game, and each one has to be leveled up individually, which turns out to be a long and boring procedure, even more so than your traditional JRPG leveling. 
I cheated while making this video, but if you want to focus on magic-based characters, you'll really need a lot of patience. It's probably easier to build up strong physical attacking characters like I did. By the way, the final boss, the reanimated demon zombie version of the Emperor, has super strong physical and magical attacks, and in theory he's pretty tough. But there is a little bit of a secret to easily beating him, namely you have to find and equip both of the blood swords found in the game. Use these and you'll do massive damage to him. The blood swords aren't otherwise very useful, so your first instinct would be to sell them to clear up valuable inventory space, uh, but they're actually worth hanging on to for their use in the last battle. So in the end analysis, Final Fantasy II is really a mixed bag. The whole crazy, screwed up leveling system is annoying as hell, and will suck much of the enjoyment out of the game. Even the exploits for building up the characters are incredibly tedious, like having to cast the same magic spell over and over again in the same battle. On the other hand, Final Fantasy II is in many ways uh, much more ambitious than the other JRPGs we've seen so far. It tries to employ an actual plot into the game, and in some cases, such as uh, Gordon and Richard the Dragoon, we see attempts at an honest-to-god character arc. The game attempts to show the horrors of war by having entire towns wiped out and having characters permanently die, and even shows the effects on their family members. And I admire Final Fantasy II for not having the typical happy, the bad guy is dead, they all live happily ever after ending. You're reminded about the people who died, and Lionheart isn't able to be reconciled with his former friends and goes off on his own separate way. It's a surprisingly dark ending for an 8-bit RPG, and while the game can't really overcome its technological limitations, by the time I was finished playing it, I actually did have a certain amount of grudging respect for it. So, Final Fantasy II, perhaps not as bad as everyone says it is. Next up is Cycle Race Roadman, another game that features bicycle racing. Boy, that logo looks very much like Namco's Family Sports Games logo. It was published, however, not by Namco, but by Tokyo Shoseki, the book publishers. It was apparently developed by Advanced Communication, which is not normally a good sign. Choose your country and then team member. Stats-wise, it looks like a toss-up between Eddie and Robert. Speed and stamina make sense, but what do spirit and tech do? Billy looks like a bit of a douchebag. According to the title screen, the race is 4,000 kilometers, about 2,500 miles. That's a really long race, longer than the Tour de France. I'm not sure if this is based on a real Japanese racing circuit or not. So, Cycle Race Roman doesn't really look like much, but it's definitely better than the cycling section of Triathlon. It works very much the same, pound the button to build up speed, though you do have to alternate between actively pedaling and coasting, otherwise your power will drop too quickly. Your other teammates will give you power up, such as refills of your power bar. You will also take damage when hitting walls. I assume perhaps this is where the tech stats come in? When the race ends, you will get some points, which you can eventually use to get a better bike. Also, your own personal stats seem to increase as well. Other factors that come into play are the wind, as well as the grade of the road. Going uphill or downhill will make it harder or easier to build up speed. As in the triathlon, steering is a little wonky. You can't really smoothly turn, and you don't hold down on the d-pad, you need to tap it to increase the tightness of your turn. This takes some getting used to, trust me. So, it's definitely not a spectacular game, but for some reason, out of the three racing games we have today, this one was the most fun. There was a bit of variety in the courses, and the very slight RPG elements kind of prod you into performing well. So, I guess, good work, guys. Thank you. 
Our next game is also a sequel, and one we've seen before. Fantasy Zone 2, the teardrop of Opa Opa, as this version is called. Sega's sequel to their classic cute up Just like the Famicom version of Fantasy Zone, this is published by Sunsoft. In Cron Turbo 2, we covered the PC Engine Fantasy Zone, and I wondered why Sega kept licensing its games to competitor systems. Well, I have no idea, but they're doing it again here. And just like the Famicom Fantasy Zone, this is considerably weaker than the Master System version. Oh man, that music is hard on the ears. Here's the old Master System version, released in October 87, covered in Cron Sega 4. A pretty decent game, though not hugely different than the first Fantasy Zone. Aside from the big downgrade in graphics and sound, the Famicom release is pretty accurate. As always, you collect the money to buy upgrades to your engine, laser, and bombs. The engine upgrades make you faster, the laser upgrades are very useful, but last a really short time. After about 30 seconds or so, they just automatically disappear. Too bad. Here's the first boss, a giant log. Actually, much like the first boss of Fantasy Zone 1, now that I think about it. There's not really that much more to say about Fantasy Zone 2. Once again, the Famicom gets the worst version of a Sega game. Keep your eyes peeled for Space Harrier a few episodes down the road. And you thought the Family Trainer series was dead, huh? Last time we saw one of these was way back in episode 27. That was Fu'un Takeshi Shiro, released in December 1987, and now we have Fu'un Takeshi Shiro 2. This was of course based on the insane Japanese game show Takeshi's Castle, in which contestants perform ridiculous stunts that invariably cause them to get knocked down or land in a pool of water. At this point, I don't really think I can even handle any more of these damned family trainer games. I mean, look at this. And this isn't even the last one. And as for Takeshi Kitano, why are there so many games based around him? There are more of them on the Famicom than there are Super Mario Bros. games. So that's it, the last straw. Takeshi and Bandai have finally broken me down with this game. I can't take any more of this crap. Forget finishing up in 1988, we're just going to skip ahead some good games. Up next, Crontendo Episode 183 and Super Metroid. See you then.